thanks very much, Michael. That was very nostalgic. Uh, our family's experience on the night the town hall blaze by John Walsh. Good evening, everybody. Now, the story, this is a story about a family uh, who lived in Main Street on the night that the town hall was burned. It was a story that was told to me many times uh, by my father, Paul Walsh. He and his siblings, with his mother, lived through that experience. So 97 years ago, on the morning of Monday, the 16th of August, 1920, District Inspector William Wilson of Manor Cottage, Templemore, was assassinated in Patrick Street by a man called Jim Stapleton, who was also known as Big Jim. Now, word of the shooting spread quickly throughout the town. An important member of the Crown establishment had been killed. People knew that there would be reprisals. The aftermath of any ambush or any killing of anybody associated with the British occupiers always called for a swift and a brutal reprisal. But as to what that would be was anybody's guess. But it was going to happen and the townspeople knew they were not going to escape. The powers that be, they wanted revenge. The auxiliaries, the black and tans, were stationed in Richmond Barracks, which is now the Garda College. The Black and Tans, they were the law and order of the day. They could do as they pleased, when they pleased, and how they pleased. And the likelihood of any inquiry into any of their actions or outcome was very slim. Sensibly, the people of Templemore knew it was better to be neither heard nor seen on this day. But it was 1920s Ireland, and what or where was a family meant to go. This one, the black arrow there, that shows the premises. The white, white arrow, I'll talk about it later on, but that's where, uh, we're still, where Kay and I still live there, but that's where my, uh, my father was living at that time. In the house there lived John Walsh, Ellen Walsh, with their four children, Peter and Paul, who were twins, and they were aged 12 on that night. Mary Walsh is four years old, and a baby, John Joe Walsh. Now, just a footnote I have here. In, I, even though John Walsh was, the, was the, uh, the father, it was very, it was likely that after the assassination of D.I. Wilson, that the authorities would round up the usual suspects. Now, given that John Walsh was a Fenian organiser, he had served time in Kilmainham jail for his Fenian activities, and he was known to be very friendly with the local intelligence officer who lived in Calais. Now, coincidentally, John Walsh just happened to be out of town on the day of the assassination, and on the day before, and didn't return till the day afterwards. He coincidentally, again, had extremely good evidence of being with <coughs> distinguished, well-known, and respectable people at a gathering in Dublin. So, good alibi. Thus, Ellen Walsh, on the day, was left to fend for herself and her, her young family. They had, she knew that vengeance was on its way. The Black and Tans, two and three, there we go. The Black and Tans, they started their, they started their consternation around 9 p.m. that evening. And they began, have you number three there as well? That's the Tans again. They began in Lower Patrick Street, and word quickly spread that the Tans had started their rampage. Have you number four? This is where they started. Just down there where you see the arrow pointing, there was a licensed premises called Rhines. They broke in there, and they helped themselves to the spirits available and to farm implements, such as axes, hammers, sledges, and so on. They started working their way up along Patrick Street, shouting, shooting, broke doors, front doors, windows. They raided a second licensed premises, and then they fortified themselves further for the continuation of their terror. 
When they reach the Crescent premises, just an arrow said they're burnt, same burnt. When they reach their Kelly's, that's Michael Kelly's premises, they set that on fire. Now, Ellen Walsh and her family heard the shouting and the shooting. They saw the smoke. Neighbours were constantly coming up to her and relating to her the up-to-date, up-to-date position <coughs> of the ongoing carnage. However, earlier in the day, once she heard about the killing and knowing that something was going to happen, she had something prepared. And her plan was to take the children from the house in Main Street and go to a stable. There was a two-storey stable at the rear of the house. This barn or stable was a slated stone structure about 40 foot long, about 20 foot deep. Now it was August. The hay had been saved, so the barn was almost full. In this barn, there was an exit at the back onto a paddock area. And from there, if need be, they could access an open field, which would bring them onto Church Road, or on, which is onto Church Avenue. Being prepared, Ellen Walsh, earlier in the day, had left some blankets and food and candles. When the sound of the shooting was heard, and the information she got that they were on their way, she took the family to the stable. Their place of hiding was at the rear of the stable, facing the exit onto the paddock. On entering the barn, she locked the front door, hoping for a bit of extra security in case the tans came into the yard. So she got everyone settled and they settled in for the night. My father recalled to us how he noticed how worried his mother was and in a childlike way he tried to console her. She told him that in all her organising she had made one very bad mistake. She had forgotten to bring down with her the infant of Prague statue. And in the rush to get them all to the stable she had left it in the front room of the house uh, in Main Street. Now, before she could stop him, my father darted from the stable out, across, out a side door and across the yard into the kitchen and into the front room. He could see the infant of Prague statue on the table, but he could also hear the shouting and cheering. He saw soldiers running past the window, so he hid behind the sofa, waiting for an opportune time. It got quiet for a while, so he went and collected the statue, and just when he had the statue in his hand, he heard the front door of the house being hit with a sledge or some he heavy implement. So he grabbed the statue and he ducked under the table. He recalled that during that time he was under the table, he was convinced he was going to die. But the fact that he had the infant of Prague statue in his grasp, he said his fear was manageable. Now, while he was under the table, two soldiers stopped outside the window. He could hear them talking and shouting, and one of them then put the, the uh, end of the rifle in through the window. So he said he could also hear this metal clanging, a sound of metal, which he couldn't make out what it was, but he could hear this going on. What he did not know was but the soldiers were actually assembling a vicar's machine gun. That's the machine gun there they were assembling. He recalled, now this is a gun which fires three or three bullets. It can fire at the rate of four to five hundred bullets per minute, and it's effective up to nearly 2,000 yards. He recalled that the soldiers had stopped talking and it got a bit quieter. He was wondering, should he make a run for it? But just to be sure, he waited a little bit longer. But then, as he said, all hell broke loose. The soldiers started firing this vicar's machine gun at the town hall. They had set the gun up in the archway beside the premises in Main Street. That is part, uh, it was an entrance into Kennedy's Forge. It is now part of Francis Murphy's pub. He recalled to us many times that when this machine gun started firing, he just ran. And he had no recollection of how he got to the stable. He just got there. And he handed the statue to his mother. And he said he felt happy and good to see the joy in her face. And she clutched the statue and then convinced him that no harm would come to him. Or would come to the family. 
Now, he used to laugh when he'd tell us this, that she did, however, scold him for bringing worry on her because she also had heard the noise of the vicar's machine gun. But he figured that when the tans had been killed him, that she wasn't going to kill him. <laughs> he recalls that during the night, they could smell the smoke, they could hear the shouting, and they could hear the shooting. And they knew that some building was burning ferociously. And they thought it was actually, the, from where the view at the back of Main Street, they could see over and they thought it was actually a premises in the corner known as Kylie's. We would know it as the Eagle Bar. And their fear was that if that was the building was on fire, then the fire was going to come the whole way down along Main Street. So they were happy not to be in the front of the house. It wasn't until the following morning that they found out that the town hall had been destroyed. Six and seven. <coughs> That's the town hall after it. That's an attempt at Photoshop me, but it didn't work. <laughs> the black and tans, despite their own fatalities during the fire, had vented their anger and their frustration on Templemore and its inhabitants. And for now, the people just had to accept what had happened, because after all, it was Ireland in the 1920s. However, for the Walsh family that lived through this experience, they knew that they were lucky. Ellen Walsh and her children were safe. Their house had not been destroyed. And as far as she was concerned, and certainly as far as my father was concerned, and grown up we were often reminded of it, it was all thanks to the infant of Prague. That statue held a sacred place in our house while we were growing up. I believe that it is still working, and I'm happy to say I still have this statue. <laughs> It's a small bit short, the head got a battery. But here's the infant of Prague that saved the Walsh. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>